Let, let me just it. add for the record that I'm sitting next to Sam, closer than I've ever sat to him except once before in my life. Um, and that his sincerity in talking about those fears is very apparent um, physically in a way that just doesn't communicate on the television screen, Thank but you. communicates from here. Professor Marcus, if you could be specific, this is your shot, man. Talk um, in plain English and tell me what, if any, rules we ought to implement. And no, at least don't just use concepts. I'm looking for specificity. Number one, a safety review like we use with the FDA prior to widespread deployment. If you're going to uh, introduce something to 100 million people, somebody has to have their eyeballs on it. There you go. Okay. That's a good one. Number I'm not sure I agree with it, but that's a good one. What else? You didn't ask for three that you would agree with. Number two, a nimble monitoring agency to follow what's going on, not just pre-review, um, but also post as things are out there in the world with authority to call things back, which we've discussed today. And number three would be funding geared towards things like AI constitution, AI that can reason about what it's doing. I would not leave things entirely to current technology, which I think is poor at behaving in ethical fashion and behaving in honest fashion. Um, and so I would have funding to try to basically focus on AI safety research. That term has a lot of complications in my field. Um, there's both safety, let's say, short-term and long-term, and I think we need to look at both. I'm interested in this talk about an agency, and you know maybe that would work. Although, having seen how agencies work in this government, they usually get captured by the interests that they're supposed to regulate. They usually get controlled by the people who they're supposed to be watching. I mean, that's just been our history for 100 years. Maybe this agency would be different. I have a little different idea. Why don't we just let people sue you? Why don't we just make you liable in court? I mean, please forgive my ignorance. Can't, can't people sue us? Isn't well, you're not protection by, protected by Section 230, but there's not currently, a, a, I don't think, a federal right of action, private right of action that says that if you are harmed by generative AI technology, we will guarantee you the ability to get into court. Oh, well, I think there's like a lot of other laws where if you know, technology harms you, uh, there's standards that we could be sued under unless I'm really misunderstanding how things work. Uh, if the question is, are more are clearer laws about the specifics of this technology and consumer protections a good thing? I would say definitely yes. The laws that we have today were designed long before we had artificial intelligence, and I do not think they give us enough coverage. Uh, the plan that you propose, I think, is a hypothetical, would certainly make a lot of lawyers wealthy, but I think it would be too slow to affect a lot of the things that we care about. And there are gaps in the law. For example, we don't really... Wait, know. you think it'd be slower than Congress? Yes, I do. In some ways. <laughs> well, really? It, well, lit litigation can take a decade or more. Oh, I but think the threat guys... of litigation is a powerful tool. How do you give this international authority the authority to regulate in a fair way for all entities involved in AI? I think that's probably over my pay grade. Um, I would like to see it happen, and I think it may be inevitable that we push there. I mean, I, I think the politics behind it are obviously complicated. I'm really heartened by the degree to which this room is bipartisan and, and supporting the same things, and that makes me feel like it might be possible. I, I would like to see the United States take leadership in such organization. It has to involve the whole world and not just the U.S. to work properly. So I just watched a Senate meeting with Sam Altman from OpenAI and Professor Gary Marcus and also a very senior lady from IBM. And I, it was surreal, honestly. Um, they were talking about the regulatory landscape of AI in the US. And I couldn't believe the candid nature of it. I couldn't believe how open Sam Altman was about some of the potential risks of the technology. There's a fundamental distinction between reproducing content and generating content. Yeah, but you, you would like liability where people are harmed. Absolutely. This hearing is on the oversight of artificial intelligence, the first in a series of hearings intended to write the rules of AI. Our goal is to demystify and hold accountable those new technologies to avoid some of the mistakes of the past. Too often, we have seen what happens when technology outpaces regulation. The unbridled exploitation of personal data, the proliferation of disinformation, and the deepening of societal inequalities 
we have seen how algorithmic biases can perpetuate discrimination and prejudice and how the lack of transparency can undermine public trust. This is not the future we want. If you were listening from home, you might have thought that voice was mine and the words from me. But in fact, that voice was not mine. The words were not mine. And the audio was an AI voice cloning software trained on my floor speeches. The remarks were written by chat GPT when it was asked how I would open this hearing. And um, the, the senators were saying historically in the US, um, companies have tried their hardest to avoid regulation. And it's almost like they were asking for regulation, but in particular, they were asking for precision regulation. I think what's happening today in this hearing room is historic. I can't recall when we've had people representing large corporations or private sector entities come before us and plead with us to regulate them. In fact, many people in the Senate have based their careers on the opposite, that the economy will thrive if government gets the hell out of the way. And what I'm hearing instead today is that stop me before I innovate again uh, message there's quite a lot of discussion about the Facebook situation. They use this uh, Section 230 law, which is that they are not responsible for the people on their platform generating harmful information. Very similar to how you can have a billboard company and you can't hold them responsible for the information that their customers are publishing. Would you be qualified if we promulgated those rules to administer those rules? I love my current job. <laughs> Cool. Are there people out there that would be qualified? We'd be happy to send you recommendations for people out there, yes. Okay. You make a lot of money, do you? I make, no. Uh, I'm paid enough for health insurance. I have no equity in OpenAI. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. You need a lawyer. You need a lawyer or an agent. I, I'm doing this because I love it. So this is particularly interesting timing because at the end of last week, we discovered the new proposed regulations from the EU on the AI Act. Um, it's pretty chilling, actually. They could potentially, this is going to come into power in 2026 and it's still just a proposal, but it could potentially ban American companies like OpenAI and Google from providing API access to generative AI models and impose massive fines for non-compliance. The act also targets open source developers and software distributors such as GitHub. The move threatens to sanction significant parts of the American tech ecosystem and could create conflicts between US and, and EU laws. The Act has extraterritorial jurisdiction, allowing third parties to sue national governments to enforce fines. And the Act's provisions are complicated, including expensive risk taking, vague risk definitions, stringent reviews, and large fines. The Act also targets API restrictions, which could cause antitrust issues for American companies, as well as open source provisions, which could lead to conflicts with distributors and developers. And critics argue that this new AI Act could encourage unsafe AI and it could create many more problems than it solves. The Act favours narrowly tailored systems which have been shown to be dangerous in the past and could lead to a situation where only the elite have access to advanced AI technologies. One of the core problems with this Act is that it designates these foundation models in the highest risk category. And a big part of that is because of their open-ended nature. You know, they could be used to generate anything. And actually a big theme here in terms of risk is the ability for users themselves to create harmful content. And where does the buck stop? Should you stop the users from doing it? Should you hold the platforms accountable for seeing what users are doing on their system? Um, it's a really, really difficult problem. Yeah, we're claiming we need to work together to find a totally new approach. I don't think Section 230 is the, even the right framework. Okay, so under the law it exists today, this tool you create, if I'm harmed by it, can I sue you? That is beyond my area of legal Have you ever been sued? Not for that, no. Have you ever been sued at all, uh, the, your company? Yeah, OpenAI gets sued. Huh? Yeah, we, we've gotten sued before. Okay. 
and what for? Um, I mean, they've mostly been like pretty frivolous things, like I think happens to any company. But like the examples my colleagues have given from artificial intelligence that could literally ruin our lives. Can we go to the company that created that tool and sue them? Is that your understanding? Yeah, I think there needs to be clear responsibility by the companies. But uh, you're not claiming any kind of legal protection like Section 2, 230 applies to your industry. Is that correct? No, I don't think we're, I don't, okay. I don't think we're saying anything. My name is Sam Altman. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of OpenAI. OpenAI was founded on the belief that artificial intelligence has the potential to improve nearly every aspect of our lives, but also that it creates serious risks we have to work together to manage. We're here because people love this technology. We think it can be a printing press moment. We have to work together to make it so. OpenAI is an unusual company, and we set it up that way because AI is an unusual technology. We are governed by a nonprofit, and our activities are driven by our mission and our charter, which commit us to working to ensure that the broad distribution of the benefits of AI and to maximizing the safety of AI systems. We are working to build tools that one day can help us make new discoveries and address some of humanity's biggest challenges, like climate change and curing cancer. Our current systems aren't yet capable of doing these things, but it has been immensely gratifying to watch many people around the world get so much value from what these systems can already do today. We love seeing people use our tools to create, to learn, to be more productive, we're very optimistic that there are going to be fantastic jobs in the future and the current jobs can get much better. We also love seeing what developers are doing to improve lives. For example, Be My Eyes used our new multimodal technology in GPT-4 to help visually impaired individuals navigate their environment. We believe that the benefits of the tools we have deployed so far vastly outweigh the risks, but ensuring their safety is vital to our work and we make significant efforts to ensure that safety is built into our systems at all levels. Before releasing any new system, OpenAI conducts extensive testing, engages external experts for detailed reviews and independent audits, improves the model's behavior, and implements safety and monitoring systems. Before we released GPT-4, our latest model, we spent over six months conducting extensive evaluations, external red teaming, and dangerous capability testing. We are proud of the progress that we made. GPT-4 is more likely to respond helpfully and truthfully and refuse harmful requests than any other widely deployed model of similar capability. However, we think that regulatory intervention by governments will be critical to mitigate the risks of increasingly powerful models. For example, the US government might consider a combination of licensing and testing requirements for development and release of AI models above a threshold of capabilities. There are several other areas I mentioned in my written testimony where I believe that companies like ours can partner with governments, including ensuring that the most powerful AI models adhere to a set of safety requirements, facilitating processes to develop and update safety measures, and examining opportunities for global coordination. And as you mentioned, uh, I think it's important that companies have their own responsibility here, no matter what Congress does. This is a remarkable time to be working on artificial intelligence. But as this technology advances, we understand that people are anxious about how it could change the way we live. We are too. But we believe that we can and must work together to identify and manage the potential downsides so that we can all enjoy the tremendous upsides. It is essential that powerful AI is developed with democratic values in mind, and this means that US leadership is critical. I believe that we will be able to mitigate the risks in front of us and really capitalize on this technology's potential to grow the U.S. economy and the world's. And I look forward to working with you all to meet this moment. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. And this is Christina Montgomery from IBM. AI is not new, but it's certainly having a moment. Recent breakthroughs in generative AI and the technology's dramatic surge in the public attention has rightfully raised serious questions at the heart of today's hearing. What are AI's potential impacts on society? What do we do about bias? What about misinformation, misuse, or harmful content generated by AI systems? Senators, these are the right questions, and I applaud you for convening today's hearing to address them head on. While AI may be having its moment, 
the moment for government to play a role has not passed us by. This period of focused public attention on AI is precisely the time to define and build the right guardrails to protect people and their interests. But at its core, AI is just a tool, and tools can serve different purposes. To that end, IBM urges Congress to adopt a precision regulation approach to AI. This means establishing rules to govern the deployment of AI in specific use cases, not regulating the technology itself. Such an approach would involve four things. First, different rules for different risks. The strongest regulation should be applied to use cases with the greatest risks to people and society. Second, clearly defining risks. There must be clear guidance on AI uses or categories of AI supported activity that are inherently high risk. This common definition is key to enabling a clear understanding of what regulatory requirements will apply in different use cases and contexts. Third, be transparent. So AI shouldn't be hidden. Consumers should know when they're interacting with an AI system and that they have recourse to engage with a real person should they so desire. No person anywhere should be tricked into interacting with an AI system. And finally, showing the impact. For higher risk use cases, companies should be required to conduct impact assessments that show how their systems perform against tests for bias and other ways that they could potentially impact the public and to attest that they've done so. By following risk-based use case specific approach at the core of precision regulation, Congress can mitigate the potential risks of AI without hindering innovation. But businesses also play a critical role in ensuring the responsible deployment of AI. Companies active in developing or using AI must have strong internal governance, including, among other things, designating a lead AI ethics official responsible for an organization's trustworthy AI strategy, standing up an ethics board or a similar function as a centralized clearinghouse for resource, resources to help guide implementation of that strategy. IBM has taken both of these steps and we continue calling on our industry peers to follow suit. Our AI ethics board plays a critical role in overseeing internal AI governance processes, creating reasonable guardrails to ensure we introduce technology into the world in a responsible and safe manner. It provides centralized governance and accountability while still being flexible enough to support decentralized initiatives across IBM's global operations. We do this because we recognize that society grants our license to operate. And with AI, the stakes are simply too high. We must build, not undermine the public trust. The era of AI cannot be another era of move fast and break things. But we don't have to slam the brakes on innovation either. These systems are within our control today, as are the solutions. What we need at this pivotal moment is clear, reasonable policy and sound guardrails. These guardrails should be matched with meaningful steps by the business community to do their part. Congress and the business community must work together to get this right. The American people deserve no less. Today's meeting is historic. I'm profoundly grateful to be here. I come as a scientist, someone who's founded AI companies, and as someone who genuinely loves AI, but who is increasingly worried. There are benefits, but we don't yet know whether they will outweigh the risks. Fundamentally, these new systems are going to be destabilizing. They can and will create persuasive lies at a scale humanity has never seen before. Outsiders will use them to affect our elections, insiders to manipulate our markets and our political systems. Democracy itself is threatened. Chatbots will also clandestinely shape our opinions, potentially exceeding what social media can do. Choices about data sets that AI companies use will have enormous unseen influence. Those who choose the data will make the rules, shaping society in subtle but powerful ways. There are other risks too, many stemming from the, in, from the inherent unreliability of current systems. A law professor, for example, was accused by a chatbot of uh, sexual harassment, untrue, and it pointed to a Washington Post article that didn't even exist. The more that that happens, the more that anybody can deny anything. As one prominent lawyer told me on Friday, Defendants are starting to claim that plaintiffs are making up legitimate evidence. These sorts of allegations undermine the abilities of juries to decide what or who to believe and contribute to the undermining of democracy. Poor medical advice could have serious consequences too. An open source large language model recently seems to have played a role in a person's decision to take their own life. The large language model asked the human, if you wanted to die, 
Why didn't you do it earlier? And then followed up with, were you thinking of me when you overdosed? Without ever referring the patient to the human help that was obviously needed. Another system rushed out and made available to millions of children told a person posing as a 13-year-old how to lie to her parents about a trip with a 31-year-old man. Further threats continue to emerge regularly. A month after GPT-4 was released, OpenAI released ChatGPT plugins, which quickly led others to develop something called AutoGPT, with direct access to the internet, the ability to write source code, and increased powers of automation. This may well have drastic and difficult to predict security consequences. What criminals are going to do here is to create counterfeit people. It's hard to even envision the consequences of that. We have built machines that are like bulls in a china shop, powerful, reckless, and difficult to control. We all more or less agree on the values we would like for our AI systems to honor. We want, for example, for our systems to be transparent, to protect our privacy, to be free of bias, and above all else, to be safe. But current systems are not in line with these values. Current systems are not transparent. They do not adequately protect our privacy, and they continue to perpetuate bias. And even their makers don't entirely understand how they work. Most of all, we cannot remotely guarantee that they're safe, and hope here is not enough. The big tech company's preferred plan boils down to trust us. But why should we? The sums of money at stake are mind-boggling. Emissions drift. OpenAI's original mission statement proclaimed, our goal is to advance AI in the way that most, is most likely to benefit humanity as a whole, unconstrained by a need to generate financial return. Seven years later, they're largely beholden to Microsoft, embroiled in part in an epic battle of search engines that routinely make things up. And that's forced Alphabet to rush out products and de-emphasize safety. Humanity has taken a back seat. AI is moving incredibly fast with lots of potential, but also lots of risks. We obviously need government involved, and we need the tech companies involved, both big and small. But we also need independent scientists, not just so that we scientists can have a voice, but so that we can participate directly in addressing the problems and evaluating solutions. And not just after products are released, but before, and I'm glad that Sam mentioned that. We need tight collaboration between independent scientists and governments in order to hold the company's feet to the fire. Allowing independent access to these independent scientists allowing independent scientists access to these systems before they are widely released as part of a clinical trial like safety evaluation is a vital first step. Ultimately, we may <coughs> need something like CERN, global, international, and neutral, but focused on AI safety rather than high energy physics. We have unprecedented opportunities here, but we are also facing a perfect storm of corporate irresponsibility, widespread deployment, lack of adequate regulation, and inherent unreliability. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever, already changing things more rapidly than almost any technology in history. We acted too slowly with social media. Many unfortunate decisions got locked in with lasting consequence. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The very fact that we are here today in bipartisan fashion to discuss these matters gives me some hope. This was Sam Altman's take on the effect on the job market. Like with all technological revolutions, I expect there to be significant impact on jobs, but exactly what that impact looks like is very difficult to predict. If we went back to the, the other side of a previous technological revolution, talking about the jobs that exist on the other side, um, you know, you can go back and read books of this. It's uh, what people said at the time. It's difficult. I believe that there will be far greater jobs on the other side of this and that the jobs of today will get better. First of all, I think it's important to understand and think about GPT-4 as a tool, not a creature, which is easy to get confused. And it's a tool that people have a great deal of control over and how they use it. Uh, and second, GPT-4 and things, other systems like it, uh, are good at doing tasks, not jobs. And so you see already people that are using GPT-4 to do their job much more efficiently um, by helping them with tasks. Now, GPT-4 will... Uh, I think, entirely automate away some jobs. And it will create new ones that we believe will be much better. This happens, again, my, my understanding of the history of technology is one long technological revolution, not a bunch of different ones put together. But this has been continually happening. We, as our quality of life raises and as machines and tools that we create can help us live better lives, uh, the bar raises for what we do and, and our human ability and what we spend our time going after uh, goes after more ambitious, more satisfying projects. So there, 
there will be an impact on jobs. Uh, we try to be very clear about that. And I think it will require partnership between the industry and government, but mostly action by government to figure out how we want to mitigate that. Um, but I'm very optimistic about how great the jobs of the future will be. History is not a guarantee of the future. It has always been the case in the past that we have had more jobs, that new jobs, new professions come in as new technologies come in. I think this one's gonna be different. And the real question is over what time scale? Is it gonna be 10 years? Is it gonna be 100 years? And I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. I think in the long run, so-called artificial general intelligence really will replace a large fraction of human jobs. We're not that close to artificial general intelligence. Despite all of the media hype and so forth, I would say that what we have right now is just a small sampling of the AI that we will build. In 20 years, when we look back um, at the AI of today, 20 years ago, we'll be like, wow, that stuff was really unreliable. It couldn't really do planning, which is an important technical aspect. Reasoning abilities were limited. Um, but when we get to AGI, artificial general intelligence, maybe let's say it's 50 years, that really is gonna have, I think, profound effects on, on labor. Should we consider independent testing labs to provide scorecards and nutrition labels or the equivalent of nutrition labels, packaging that indicates to people whether or not the content can be trusted, what the ingredients are? Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. These models are getting more accurate over time. Uh, you know, this is, this is, as we have, I think, said as loudly as anyone, this technology is in its early stages. It definitely still makes mistakes. We find that people, that users, are, are pretty sophisticated and understand where the mistakes are that they need, or likely to be, that they need to be responsible um, for verifying what the models say, that they go off and check it. Um, I, I worry that as the models get better and better, uh, the users can have sort of less and less of their own discriminating thought process around it. But but I think users are more capable than we give, often give them credit for in, in conversations like this. I think a lot of disclosures, which if you use ChatGPT, you'll see about the inaccuracies of the model um, are also important. And I'm, I'm excited for a world where companies publish with the models information about how they behave, where the inaccuracies are, and independent agencies or companies provide that as well. I think it's a great idea. On, on the subject of nutrition labels, I, I think we absolutely need to do that. I think that there's some technical challenges and that building proper nutrition labels goes hand in hand with transparency. The biggest scientific challenge in understanding these models is how they generalize. What do they memorize and what new things do they do? The more that there's in the data set, for example, the thing that you want to test accuracy on, the less you can get a proper read on that. So it's important, first of all, that scientists be part of that process. And second, that we have much greater transparency about what actually goes into these systems. If we don't know what's in them, then we don't know exactly how well they're doing when we give something new, and we don't know how good a benchmark that will be for something that's entirely novel. I thought this was quite an instructive part of the conversation. Uh, one of the senators was asking Sam Altman about what he considers to be harmful content. And she gave an interesting example. And Sam Altman replied that you should be able to detect harmful content. And also the users of generative models should be forced to show clearly, or perhaps the platforms as well should show clearly that content is generated. And this to me demonstrated that he still thinks AI as it is today shouldn't be licensed. There should just be these controls maybe on the platform and the users. And I think that distinguishes Sam from Gary because Gary presumably thinks that um, perhaps even models today should be licensed and regulated. What, what do you consider a harmful request? One would be about violent content. Okay. Um, another would be about content that's encouraging self-harm. Another's adult content, not that we think adult content is inherently harmful, but there's things that could be associated with that that we cannot reliably enough differentiate, so we refuse all of it. So those are some of the more obvious harmful kinds of, uh, of uh, information, but in the election context, for, uh, for example, I, I saw a picture of uh, former President Trump being arrested by NYPD, and that went viral. I don't know, is that considered harmful? There are things besides... Uh, you know, should this content be generated or not that I think are also important. So that image that you mentioned was generated. I think it'd be a great policy to say generated images need to be made clear in all contexts that they were generated. And, you know, then we still have the image out there, but it's, we're at least requiring people to say this was a generated image. 
Sam Altman impressed me on this bit as well. So um, cynically with regulation, we quite often say that large corporations embrace regulation because it kind of raises the bar and it makes it very, very difficult for startups or competitors starting out getting into the scene. And Sam Altman was absolutely resolute that he does want the innovation, the startups, he wants to maintain that fire. And he was really open about that and, and I was impressed. This is even more relevant given the new EU and the AI Act, which might have a chilling effect on startups in particular trying to build these types of large language models. I think it's super important. I think there are very different levels here. Um, and I think it's important that any any new approach, any new law does not stop the innovation from happening with smaller companies, open source models, researchers that are doing work at a smaller scale. Uh, that's a wonderful part of this ecosystem and of America. We don't want to slow that down. There still may need to be some rules there. Um, but I think we could draw a line at systems that need to be licensed in a very intense way. The easiest way to do it, I'm not sure if it's the best, but the easiest would be to talk about the amount of compute that goes into such a model. So we could, you know, we could define a threshold of compute and it'll have to go, it'll have to change. It could go up or down, uh, could, down as we discover more efficient algorithms that says above this amount of compute, you are in this regime. Um, what I would prefer, uh, it's harder to do, but I think more accurate, is to define some capability thresholds and say a model that can do things X, Y, and Z, up to you all to decide, uh, that's now in this licensing regime, but models that are less capable, you know, we don't want to stop our open source community, we don't want to stop individual researchers, we don't want to stop new startups, can proceed, you know, with a different frame. As you can, please state which capabilities you'd propose we consider for the purposes of this definition. Uh, I would love, rather than to do that off the cuff, to follow up with your office with like a well, perhaps opine things. Op opine understanding that you're just responding uh, and you're not making law. All right, in the spirit of just opining, um, I think a model that can uh, persuade, manipulate, influence a person's behavior or a person's beliefs that would be a good threshold. Um, I think a model that could help create novel biological agents would be a great threshold. Things like that. The topic of the AI moratorium came up, and I thought the exchange was very interesting. Check it out. On the issue of the moratorium, I think we need to be careful. The world won't wait. The rest of the global scientific community isn't going to pause. We have adversaries that are moving ahead, and sticking our head in the sand is not the answer. Safeguards and protections, yes, but a flat stop sign, sticking our head in the sand. I noticed that an eclectic group of about a thousand technology and AI leaders, everybody from Andrew Yang to Elon Musk recently called for a six month moratorium on any further AI development. Should we pause for six Your months? Your characterization is not quite correct. Um, I actually signed that letter, about 27,000 people signed it. Mm -hmm. um, it did not call for a ban on all AI research. It only called, in, nor on all AI, but only on a very specific thing, which would be systems like GPT-5. Um, every other piece of research that's ever been done, it was actually supportive or neutral about. And it's specifically called for more research on trustworthy and safe AI. I'm asking for your opinion now, though. So do, my, would, do my, you endorse My opinion the is that the moratorium that we should focus on is actually deployment until we have good safety cases. Um, I don't know that we need to pause that particular project, but I do think it's emphasis on focusing more on AI safety, on trustworthy, reliable AI is exactly right. Deployment means not making it available to the public? Yeah, so, so my, my concern is about things that are deployed at a scale of, let's say, 100 million people without any external review. I think that we should think very carefully about doing that. What about you, Mr. Elman? Do you agree with that? Would you, would you pause any further development for six months or longer? Uh, so first of all, we, after we finished training GPT-4, we waited more than six months to deploy it. Um, we are not currently training what will be GPT-5. We don't have plans to do it in the next six months. But I think the frame of the letter is wrong. What matters is audits, red teaming, s safety standards that a model needs to pass before training. If we pause for six months, then I'm not really sure, sure what we do then. Do we pause for another six? Do we kind of come up with some rules then. The standards that we have developed and that we've used for GPT-4 deployment, uh, we want to build on those, but we think that's the right direction, uh, not a calendar clock pause. 
there may be times, I expect there will be times when we find something that we don't understand and we really do need to take a pause, but we don't see that yet. Never mind all the benefits. What, what, you, you don't see what yet? You're comfortable with all of the potential ramifications from the current existing technology? I'm sorry, we don't see the reasons to not train a new one for deploying. As I mentioned, I think there's all sorts of risky behavior and there's limits we put. We have to pull things back sometimes, add new ones. I mean, we don't see something that would stop us from training the next model. Uh, where we'd be so worried that we'd create something dangerous even in that process, let alone the deployment. I would just again emphasize there is a difference between research, which surely we need to do to keep pace with our foreign rivals, and deployment at really massive scale. Even, you know, you could deploy things at the scale of a million people or 10 million people, but not 100 million people or a billion people. And if there are risks, you might find them out sooner and be able um, to close the barn doors before the horses leave rather than after. Yeah, I, I just, there will be no pause. I mean, there's no enforcement body to force a pause. It's just not not going to happen. It's nice to call for it uh, for any Great. just reasons or whatsoever, but I'm for, forgive me for sounding skeptical. Nobody's pausing. This thing is I crazy. Would agree. You, 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 I, I would agree. I mean, I don't think it's a realistic thing in the world. The reason I personally signed the letter was to call attention to how serious the problems were and to emphasize spending more of our efforts on trustworthy and safe AI rather than just making a bigger version of something we already know to be unreliable. Another thing I found interesting is that the senators, clearly they've been used to interrogating Mark Zuckerberg and they had the mindset of social media. So they kept talking about attentional metadata and, um, you know, basically all of the, the, the harms of social media. And um, Sam Altman was clear to make a distinction that OpenAI is not a social media company and the model is quite different. I... First of all, I think we try to design systems uh, that do not maximize for engagement. In fact, we're so short on GPUs, uh, the less people use our products, the better. Um, but we're not an advertising-based model. We're not trying to get people to use it more and more. Um, and I think that's, di that's a different shape than ad-supported social media. Second, uh, these systems do have the capability to, to influence in obvious and in very nuanced ways. Um, and I think that's particularly important for the safety of children, but that will that will impact all of us. One of the things that we'll do ourselves, uh, regulation or not, but I think a regulatory approach would be good for also, is requirements about how the values of these systems are set and how these systems respond to questions that can cause influence. OpenAI does not, we're not off, you know, we wouldn't have an ad-based business model, so we're not trying to build up these profiles of our users. We're not we're not trying to get them to use it more. Actually, we'd love it if they use it less because we don't have enough GPUs. I just want to thank you both. This has been one of the best hearings I've had this Congress and uh, just a testimony to you two as seeing uh, the, the challenges and the opportunities that AI presents. So I appreciate you both. I, I want to just jump in. I, I think very broadly, and then I'll get a little more narrow. Uh, uh, Sam, you said very broadly, technology has been moving like this. And we are, uh, a lot of people have been talking about regulation and so I use the example of, of the automobile. What an extraordinary uh, piece of technology. I mean, New York City did not know what to do with force manure. They were having crises, forming commissions, and the automobile comes along, ends that problem. But at the same time, we have tens of thousands of people dying on highways every day. We have emissions crises and the like. There are multiple federal agencies, multiple federal agencies that were created uh, or are specifically focused on regulating cars. Um, and, and so this idea that this equally transforming technology is coming and for Congress to do nothing, which is not what anybody here is, is, is uh, calling for, little or nothing, is, is obviously unacceptable. Mr. Marcus, there's no way, to, no way to put this genie in the bottle. Globally, this is, it, it's exploding. There's, there's no way to stop this moving forward. So with that understanding, what kind of encouragement do you have as specifically as possible to forming an agency, to using current rules and regulations. I think we need to be concerned about internet access for these tools when they can start making requests, both of people and, and internet things. It's probably okay if they just do search, but as they do more intrusive things on the internet, as we empower these systems more by giving them internet access, I think we need to be concerned about that. And then we've hardly talked at all about long-term risk. Sam alluded to it briefly. Um, I don't think that's where we are right now, but as we start to approach machines that have a larger footprint on the world beyond just having a conversation, we need to worry about that and think about how we're going to regulate that and, and monitor it and so forth. Uh, let me just insert, there are more genies yet to come from more bottles. Some genies are already out. 
but we don't have machines that can really, for example, self-improve themselves. Um, we don't really have machines that have self-awareness, and we might not ever want to go there. So there are other genies to be concerned about. I think we don't really understand what self-awareness is, and so it's hard to put a date on it. Um, in terms of self-improvement, there's some modest self-improvement in current systems, but one could imagine a lot more, and that could happen in two years, it could happen in 20 years. This this bit was remarkable. I mean, I, I love Gary, obviously, but um, Gary wrote an article saying that deep learning is hitting a wall, and he's basically made a career out of criticizing deep learning and saying that it will never amount to anything. And here he is in front of the US Senate saying that it might potentially start self-improving. Uh, it's just, yeah, what a time to be alive. Uh, in a sense, we've been talking about bad guys or um, certain bad actors manipulating AI to do harm. Manipulating people. And manipulating people, but also generative AI can manipulate the manipulators. It, it can. I mean, there's, there's many layers of manipulation that are possible, and I think we don't yet really understand the consequences. They're not perfectly human-like yet, but they're good enough to fool a lot of the people a lot of the time. I, I certainly agree that those are important points. Um, I would add that, and Professor Marcus touched on this, I would add that as we, we spend most of the time today on current risks, and I think that's appropriate, and I'm very glad we have done it, uh, as these systems do become more capable, and I'm not sure how far away that is, but maybe not, not super far, I think it's important that we also spend time talking about how we're going to confront those challenges. Real quick, um, first of all, you're a bit of a unicorn when I sat down with you first. Uh, could you explain why nonprofit? In other words, you're, 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 you're not looking at this, and you've even capped the VC people. Just really quickly, I want folks to understand that. We started as a nonprofit, uh, really focused on how this technology was going to be built. At the time, it was very outside the Overton window that something like AGI was even possible. That's that shifted a lot. Um, we didn't know at the time how important scale was going to be. Are you ever going to do ads uh, or something like that? I wouldn't say never. I don't think, like, I think there may be people that we want to offer services to and there's no other model that works. But I really like having a subscription-based model. I think there will be many people that develop models. Uh, what's happening now in the open source community is amazing, but there will be a relatively small number of providers that can make models at the at the true is there danger edge. In that? Um, I think there is benefits and danger to that. Like as we were talking about all of the dangers with AI, the fewer of us that you really have to keep a careful eye on on the absolute like bleeding edge of capabilities, there's benefits there. Uh, but then I think there needs to be enough, and there will because there's so much value that consumers have choice, that we have different ideas. There, there is a real risk of a kind of technocracy combined with oligarchy, where a small number of companies influence people's beliefs through the nature of these systems. These systems can subtly shape our beliefs, and that has enormous influence um, on how we live our lives. And having a small number of players do that with data that we don't even know about, that scares me. What these systems get aligned to, whose values, what those bounds are, that that is somehow set by society as a whole, by governments as a whole. And so creating that data set, the align that our alignment data set, it could be, you know, an AI constitution, whatever it is, the f that has got to come very broadly from society. So we don't want to slow down uh, open source efforts. We still need them to comply with things. They can still, you can still cause great harm with a smaller model, but leaving the room and the space for new ideas and new companies, uh, and independent researchers to do their work and not put in uh, a regulatory burden that say a company like us could handle, but a smaller one couldn't. Um, I think that's another peril and it's clearly a way that regulation has gone. The other obvious peril is regulatory capture. If, if we make it as appear as if we are doing something, but it's more like greenwashing and nothing really happens. We just keep out the little players because we put so much burden that only the big players can do it. I was attorney general of Connecticut for 20 years. I was a federal prosecutor, the U.S. attorney. Most of my career has been in enforcement. And I will tell you something, you can create 10 new agencies, but if you don't give them the resources, and I'm talking not just about dollars, I'm talking about scientific expertise, you guys will run circles around them. And it isn't just the, the models or the generative AI that will run models around, run circles around them but it is the scientists in your company. 
uh, for every success story in government regulation, you can think of five failures. That's true of the FDA. It's true of the IAEA. It's true of the SEC. It's true of the whole alphabet list of government agencies. And I hope our experience here will be different. But the Pandora's box requires more than just the words or the concepts, licensing, new agency. There's some real hard decision-making, as Ms. Montgomery has alluded to, about how to frame the rules to fit the risks. First, do no harm. Make it effective. Make it enforceable. What specific steps do you take uh, to protect privacy? Well, one is that we don't train on any data submitted to our API. So if you're a, a business customer of ours and submit data, uh, we don't train on it at all. We do retain it for 30 days solely for the purpose of trust and safety enforcement. Um, but that's different than training on it. If you use ChatGPT, uh, you can opt out of us training on your data. Um, you can also delete your conversation history or your whole account. One thing that is absolutely paramount, I think, is far greater transparency about what the models are and what the data are. That doesn't necessarily mean everybody in the general public has to know exactly what's in one of these systems. But I think it means that there needs to be some enforcement arm that can look at these systems, can look at the data, um, can perform tests and so forth. I really want to just explore what happens when these companies that are already controlling so much of our lives, we, a lot has been written about the FANG companies, what happens when they are the ones that are dominating this technology as they did before? Corporate power, corporate concentration has in this realm that a few companies might, might control this whole area. I radically changed the shape of my own life in the last few months. And it was because of what happened with Microsoft releasing Sydney. And it didn't go the way I thought it would. In one way, it did, which is I anticipated the hallucinations. And I said that it would still be a good tool for misinformation, that it would still have trouble with physical reasoning, psychological reasoning, that it would hallucinate. And then along came Sydney, and the initial press reports were quite favorable. And then there was the famous article by Kevin Roos in which it um, recommended he get a divorce. And I had seen Tay, and I had seen Galactica from Meta, and those had been pulled after they had problems. And Sydney clearly had problems. What I would have done had I run Microsoft, which clearly I do not, would have been to temporarily withdraw it from the market. And they didn't. And that was a wake-up call to me and a reminder that even if you have a company like OpenAI that is a nonprofit and Sam's values, I think, have come clear today, other people can buy those companies and do what they like with them. And, you know, maybe we have a stable set of actors now, but the amount of power that these systems have to shape our views and our lives is really, really significant. And that doesn't even get into the risks that someone might repurpose them deliberately for all kinds of bad purposes. And so in the middle of February, I stopped writing much about technical issues in AI, which is most of what I've written about for the last decade, and said, I need to work on policy. This is frightening. Well, I, I was one, I'm a big believer in the democratizing potential of technology, but I've seen the promise of that fail time and time again, uh, where people said, oh, this is going to have a big democratizing force. My team works on a lot of issues about the reinforcing of, uh, of, of bias through algorithms, the failure to advertise certain opportunities and certain zip codes. Um, but you seem to be saying, and I heard this with Web3, yeah. that this is going to be DeFi, uh, decentralized finance. All these things are going to happen, I think, going to be very centralized to a few players who already control so much. So this point that I made about use of, use of the model and building on top of it, as it, this is really a new platform, right? People frequently comment like i can't believe you get this much technology for this little money uh and so what people are the companies people are building putting ai everywhere using our api which does let us put safeguards in place uh i think that's quite exciting and i think that is how it is being democ not not how it's going to be but how it is being democratized right now um there is a whole new cambrian explosion of new businesses new products new services happening by lots of different companies on top of these models one of the things that I'm most concerned about with GPT-4 is that we don't know what it's trained on. Um, I guess Sam knows, but the rest of us do not. And what it is trained on has consequences. Anyway, we're up to 58 minutes now, so I'm going to stop editing. Uh, I think I've extracted all of the most interesting parts from the Senate discussion. It was a fascinating discussion. I hope you've enjoyed this summary, and we'll see you back very soon. 
Cheers.